right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Xander. As you saw, we had a few technical difficulties. I have a few videos with sound, but unfortunately, we're going to have to leave the sound at home. Uh, but I think the images by themselves will, will also work fine. Um, so my talk is going to be about um, using machine learning to create digital art. So this is a little bit of a new uh, upcoming uh, scene. And I actually wanted to start my talk by actually trying to do something collaborative. So if my slide deck here moves, um, I'm going to try to create a little bit of collective art with all of you guys. So I need a little bit of help before we get going with the presentation. Um, so I would like a few of you, not everyone, but maybe you know, if both your neighbors are taking out their phone, then you can leave yours in your pocket. But a few people scan the QR code. This will bring you to a URL, and you can upload images on that URL. So I want you to just think about this. Um, do you have a very nice and beautiful image on your phone? It could be a picture you took on vacation, maybe a landscape photograph, or an art piece, some architectural photograph. Just think about this. Do I have a nice image on my phone? And it should also be a landscape image, so a wide image, not a portrait mode image. If you do, you think, oh yeah, I had this nice image on vacation, and you wouldn't mind having it displayed on the big screen, then please upload some images. So if like a couple of people do this, uh, this demo should normally work out. Uh, so while I let the people upload, I also need a little bit of additional help um, because what we're going to do is we're going to take those images and we're going to transform them into paintings. So we obviously need some painters as well. So what I did, um, I actually, I started this demo, I started coding this uh, yesterday night, so there is a very high chance that something might go wrong, uh, but we'll try it anyway. So what I did is I, I set up um, a machine learning system at home on my graphics card, and what it's going to do is it's going to take those images that are being uploaded by the people here. I do need internet connection. Come on. Okay. So this is me logging into my computer that's sitting in, in my living room, and I have some code prepared here, and I would like to ask the audience, could you name some uh, of your favorite painters? Just shout a few names, and I'll type them in. Okay, hold on. So, Rémi Magritte, another one? How do you spell that? Chagan? I actually don't know this painter. Is it like this? There is no screen. Uh, oh boy. Okay, anyway, shout, sh shout some more names and we'll, we'll fix the screen later. So, what? Okay, Frida Kahlo, nice one. Uh, some more? Hoppus? Some more? Okay. All right, I think I have a few. Um, and now I'm going to start to run this and hopefully things work out. The fact that I don't have a screen is annoying. Okay. So far, trying to do a live demo. I, I hope I get the screen back. Yeah, we got the screen back. It's okay. It's okay. We, we had the screen. It's okay. I think it's coming. Yeah, this is what happens when you try to do live demos that you haven't properly prepared. Okay, we're, we're back in the slides. Uh, so hopefully I can show something at the end of the presentation. If not, then you know, I did my best. So anyway, um, let's start by, by talking a little bit about what is art. So if you, if you type in the term artist on Google, this is kind of the general picture that you get about you know, this is an artist. So we have this traditional image of you know, a person that has managed um, a physical skill to create artworks. Um, for me, this is a little bit different. I am a digital artist, so when I'm creating art, I usually look more like this. I sit in front of a computer, I might have some ideas in my mind, and I try to use uh, computer programming to create digital art pieces. Um, so where a traditional artists would use something like paintbrushes and maybe a blank canvas, I use a keyboard and I try to manipulate pixels. Right? So I have this limited set of pixels, the screen usually has a couple of millions, and the idea is to use software 
that you write to create something interesting there. Uh, and where most people learn their skills, maybe in uh, art workshops, most of the things that I do, I learned online. I took a lot of computer programming courses, computer science courses, and so most of the skill sets that I use when I'm making art are things that anyone can just learn on the internet. Now, a quick word about myself. I actually started out studying electrical engineering at the University of Ghent, and I only discovered uh, machine learning very late in my, in my career um, when I actually did my master's, my master's thesis on brain-computer interfaces. So we were working with uh, locked-in patients. So those are people who had a trauma, and they lost complete control over their body. So they cannot move a single muscle in their body, which also means that they cannot speak. And so what we did there is we, uh, we used these EEG devices, which can measure brain signals. And for most of those locked-in patients, the brain is perfectly fine. The brain is sending all the signals that it needs to. It's just that the signals don't arrive in the muscles, and therefore nothing happens. So what we do is you can take these EEG headsets, and you can actually start looking at those brain signals. So you ask the person, hey, try to move your right hand or your left hand. And then nothing happens, but the brain signals are there. And you can then use machine learning to try and make sense of that huge mess of data and to try and figure out what this person is trying to do. And then if you hook up those signals to a digital keyboard, those people can start typing letters and sentences. And so we, we had people who had been in this locked-in situation for years and suddenly regained the ability to talk. And so at that point, I was, I was very impressed. I was like, this technology is like magic. And I decided to like, completely change my career. I left electronics for good, and I became a computer programmer. Um, ever since then, I've done a lot of consulting and deep learning. Uh, I'm actually working in computational biology right now. So during the day, I, I try to design um, proteins and new therapeutics using AI. And at night, I'm a little bit of a, a digital artist, and I use code to create cool things because I've always had this quest for aesthetics. Like, how can we use technology to create beautiful and meaningful things? Um, so I want to talk about generative AI, and I'm going to slice this talk up into two big um, elements that people use within generative AI to create stuff. So the first thing is something that maybe people have already heard about. It's this generative adversarial network. And I'm going to try to do something bold to try and explain what this model actually does, how it works. Because I feel like a lot of the issues surrounding AI come from the fact that most people have really no idea what is going on under the hood. And I feel like if you lift a little bit of that magic, it suddenly becomes a lot more like, you know, there's a deliberate process going on. So this is the guy who invented GANs. He's a very smart guy who works at Google Brain. And in 2014, he actually uh, went to a bar. He got pretty drunk with friends, and he suddenly had this idea. He rushed home. Uh, got in front of his computer, and he coded up this idea, and by the next morning, he realized, hey, this thing actually works. So what he did is the following. You have, this is kind of the general diagram. You have two networks. So the blue one is the first neural network, and we call this one the generator. And this generator, you can think of it as the painter. This is the guy who's going to create a piece of art. The second neural network is the discriminator, and you can think of it as the art critic. So it looks at an image and it tries to figure out, you know, did this image, did it originate from the generator or did it come from an actual database of real existing images, right? So we give this generator a bunch of random noise. It uses whatever machinery is inside to produce an image. And then this image is fed to the discriminator and the discriminator gets images from two sources. It just never knows which one it's looking at. It could either get an image from the discriminator or it gets one from a real uh, set of images and then it needs to decide which one it is. And if you hook these two things together, it turns out that you can train both networks and eventually you end up with a generator network that can create images that look very, very similar to what you trained them on, right? So now you suddenly have a machine learning system that can take noise and it can transform it into images and depending on what images you train that system on, you get completely different outputs. Um, this was the very first publication by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. And he trained this on uh, images of faces. And now you can see these faces look kind of blurry, not very sharp, not very impressive. But this paper was published, and a lot of people uh, adopted this idea, started improving it. This is another paper from 2015. 
These are the results from 2060. And nowadays, we can use these models to generate faces that look incredibly realistic. I mean, none of these people exist. All of these faces were generated by a model that simply tried to generate very realistic looking images. Okay, so this was like two years ago. Here's a, a very nice image of what this looks like during training. And we can take those models and you can actually manipulate the outputs in very interesting ways. So this has a lot of applications. Now, unfortunately, um, the most common application that you see in media is usually not the very positive things. It's things like, you know, creating synthetic faces of people that don't exist, creating things like deep fakes. Um, and to be clear, this is a very serious issue. We need to be aware that there are techniques out there that can completely fool our perspective and our judgment. Um, and in fact, we actually made, um, we did a, a stunt a few years ago where we actually deep faked Wim de Wildig. I worked on this project uh, to basically show people that this is possible and you should be aware of this, right? If you get a letter from Barack Obama telling you to transfer all your money to some bank account, you're not gonna believe that letter was written by Obama, so why should you believe it if you see a video, right? Everything can be faked. Um, but at the same time, I also had this feeling like everybody is focusing on the negative aspects, but this is an incredible technology. Why is nobody using this to make art? And so, I started thinking about like what, what could you use this technology for? And so the first experiment that I did is like instead of just training it on faces, why not train it on a mix of faces and animal faces, right? So this was kind of funny, interesting results. Um, the model does something crazy and you, have, you, you kind of have control over what it's doing, but not exactly. Uh, and then I started looking for more and more image data sets, specifically with the idea in mind of looking for aesthetics. So not looking at function, but just looking at what, what looks good, what is interesting. And I started posting these things online and I got very good results. And I myself was also impressed by what these models can actually do if you train them in the right regimes. But then I started thinking like, why are we feeding random noise to these networks? Like who cares about random noise? Why don't we use music, right? And so I started thinking like, could you use these models to transform audio into something visual that corresponds very closely to the audio. So I wrote some code to, um, to take in an audio file and extract a lot of things that we hear when we listen to music. So we hear things like melodies and chords, percussion, um, and to extract all those elements from an audio file and to then use that to control what the model is generating. And so this is the point where I was gonna show you an incredibly nice audio-visual creation that I did, but without the sound, I think I'm just gonna skip it because, yeah, it's a little bit, it, it lacks half the value if you don't hear what's going on. Um, I, I have a few other examples that are also visual, but without uh, the sound. So I started creating these artworks uh, using neural networks as like the basis of generating the pixels, right? And I posted these online and I got very cool feedback. A lot of people loved what I was doing and I did a few immersive art installations, and all of the pixels here are actually generated by neural networks, right? And the nice thing is that if you link them up to music and you look at these pieces, you have this very strange feeling that what you see and what you hear is, is very, very well aligned. And this is like this, uh, you know, this is like the basis of, of what I started doing. Uh, I have a lot more pieces on my uh, Vimeo channel, so if you wanna hear and see at the same time, I would definitely recommend to, to check out the Vimeo and, and uh, use a good headphone. Uh, some of those are very interesting. Uh, so I posted this online, I got a lot of very good feedback and a lot of people were, were reaching out to me and say, hey, I, I wanna do this too. I, I wanna learn how to, how to make these things. I would like to use this. I had a lot of um, reaching out from musicians, for example, that would like to have these kinds of visuals for their music. Um, and then I realized, you know, to make this stuff, you have to have a lot of technical skills. Like, this is not easy. So what I did is, at first, I started open sourcing pieces of my code. So there's an open source package, for example, that can do uh, audio extraction. So it takes all these elements from the audio. Um, but then I realized, you know, like most people that want to use this stuff are not programmers. They don't know how to use Linux. They don't know what GitHub is. They don't code in Python. There's a lot of artists that might want to use this, but don't necessarily know how to code. And so I came up with uh, the first software product that I launched, which is Wizard. 
And so Wizard is like a web-based platform where anyone can just upload their audio and then we created a very nice visual interface. You can select a visual theme depending on what kind of visual style you're looking for. Uh, so we trained all these different uh, generative models using different uh, image data sets. And then you can also curate your own visual narrative, like what type of image transitions are you looking for. You select samples that were generated by these AI models, and then you can basically string them together into a video. And so we, we've seen a lot of people use our platform for creating music videos for their own uh, music. So there's a nice little interface, um, and you can definitely check out Wizard for yourself if you have a musical project and you're looking for visuals. It's definitely an interesting uh, to try. So that was the first part about generative adversarial networks. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is another model that has become incredibly popular over the past four or five months. So again, like machine learning is moving very quickly. Things are usually, um, yeah, you have to keep up with what's going on and there's a lot of stuff uh, that, that keeps popping up. So this is uh, the new model I've been playing with for the past couple of months. Uh, so this was the picture for this generative adversarial network. Um, I'll now sketch what the new model does. So the idea behind CLIP is very simple. You take an image, you send it through a neural network, and this neural network basically tries to summarize like what is in this image, what's inside. And you do the same thing with a different neural net, but this one looks at text. So you give it a piece of text, and it just tries to summarize like what is in this sentence. And then, these two neural networks, they try to agree, does the text match the image? Yes or no, right? So if you feed it um, an image of a puppy like this and you say a picture of a puppy, the network will say, yes, that's a match. If you feed it this image and you say, is that a painting by Picasso? It will say, no, that's not a match. And is it a red car? Yes, it's a red car. Is it a red Tesla? Yes, definitely that. So this is what Clip does, very simple. It matches text to images. Uh, and in fact, this model was trained by a very large research group in San Francisco called OpenAI. And they published this model, so it's publicly available. Anyone can use it. And it has a lot of commercial applications. Because if you think about it, if you're a company and you have millions of images on some database and you're looking for a specific image, well, it's incredibly useful if you can just type a sentence that describes the image you're looking for and then Clip can go and search those millions of images and just retrieve what you're looking for, right? So this has a lot of applications. Um, but in fact, the most used application of Clip today is making art. And that was not at all what OpenAI had in mind when they published this model. So how do you use Clip to make art? Well, some very clever guy came up with this idea, like why do you use an image that's real? Why not generate the image using a third neural network? So remember the generator we had before? Well, we take the generator, and the output of that generator, we feed it to Clip, and then if we put in a sentence there, let's say a beautiful mountain landscape, what we then do is we use the feedback that comes out at the top there to adjust the image in the generator so that it matches the text description. And if you run this entire pipeline, suddenly your model can generate images but now you don't need a data set anymore, you're just typing sentences. And the model can transform those sentences into images, right? Um, and look, now we're using three neural networks instead of two. So like, this is just to show you like the creativity is quite limitless. It depends on like which skills you have and how much you understand about machine learning, but these things can be recombined in a thousand different ways. Um, so I tried a sentence, life finds a way. Um, this is what you get. You get these very cool looking optimized images. And I'm always surprised by how the model chooses to visualize certain sentences. So these models are very good at um, taking a very abstract sentence where you as a human wouldn't necessarily know how to visualize it and then coming up with some very interesting way to, to try to visualize that sentence. And now, a lot of people have this idea, well, how is this creating art? Because you as a human, you're just sitting there, and the machine is doing all the work, right? And I can understand that view, but the reality is quite different. The reality is that, as a programmer, you're looking at this universe of computational tools, and there's a lot of them. There are thousands of different neural networks, there's all these papers, all these techniques, and then the question is, like, how do you use them? How do you combine them, right? 
And obviously, you do that by programming. And usually, when you start programming, you have some kind of idea. You have a, a mindset, something you're trying to achieve. You program the model, and then you look at what it produces. And oftentimes, those th results will be very surprising. You will see things you didn't expect. It might be slightly different than what you were expecting. And then you get ideas, right? You think, wow, this is interesting but it's not exactly what I want. I'm gonna change the code, and then you get this iterative cycle where you as a programmer are interacting with a machine learning model, and the machine learning model by itself can't do anything. You are really in control of everything, but there is this interaction going on, this back and forth, where you're constantly reevaluating what the model produces, then coming up with new ideas, and you know trying to adjust things to get it better. So I always say that I don't fully create these pieces, and neither does the machine. It's very much a co-creative process. And I found this, uh, this quote from a person on Twitter to be very relevant. The code is the art, because that's what you spend all your time doing, right? Now I can make art pieces by just typing a few sentences and hitting run, but I spent months creating the code that allows me to do that, right? So all the work is going into creating that architecture in which the model can produce the results that you're looking for. Uh, to give you an idea, when I first started this project, uh, this is, these are some of the images that I got. So you can see these are three separately generated images for the sentence, according to Wittgenstein, a picture is a model of reality. And you can see these pictures, yeah, you can kind of see how they match the sentence, but there's not that much diversity between the images. They don't look very sharp. And so I spent months trying to change the way that the model uses the text in order to get those images to look better. And now I'm getting results like this, where there's a lot more going on in these images. And some of these samples that the model produces are very interesting to me. I, I look at these and I say, I would never have been able to paint this, but the model also would have never generated this if I hadn't spent all this time working on the code and trying to get to a point where I feel like, you know, this is, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, here's another piece called a city made of gold, or what about interdimensional encounter, all right? And so every single time I'm working with these models, I'm always incredibly impressed by what they can produce. I mean, this is a machine in a box that's suddenly, you know, able to control pixels and to generate things that are incredibly impressive. Right? Again, this didn't come out of nowhere. I spent many, many hours trying to get there. And so here, for example, is another sample. And what I did here is I limited the amount of colors that the model can play with. So here, the model, instead of being able to do whatever, it can only use 10 different colors. And it needs to produce an image that matches a text description using only 10 different colors. Here's another example with a limited color palette. So you can see that as an artist, using these tools, you have a tremendous degree of control over how you try to achieve those outputs, right? Um, and the final thing that I want to show is something that I started doing a few weeks ago, um, where instead of starting from a completely random image, what if you could um, have even more impact over the output, if you have even larger degrees of control? So the idea here is that instead of starting from this random pixel image, what if you started from an existing image? So you give, it, you give the model a seed image, and then the model is already starting from this image. It's not starting from a random image, it's already starting from something that you choose. And then maybe you choose a sentence, fading colors, blowing in the wind, and then it transforms that starting image using the text query, right? And so now, as an artist, you're in a situation where you can use existing images to define the global shape and the composition of an image, but then you can use language and text to create the textures and the emotions that you're looking for. So suddenly, as an artist, you have a tremendous degree of control over like, what am I trying to make here, right? How am I going to use these models to produce the kinds of aesthetics that I'm looking for, right? Here are some more samples. All of these are started from existing images, but then you're using language to transform the textures that those images are rendered in. And the final thing I want to talk about is, is ownership and intention, because there is a little bit of a problem here. Um, all of this happens in software, right? So once the software is written, 
it's fairly easy for anyone to just take that piece of software and run it on your own computer and say, hey, I'm an artist. Because look, this is what it generates. Even though you have no clue what's going on under the hood, it's very simple to spread these kinds of softwares. And though there's lots of people online saying, you know, I used an AI and this is what it generated, look. But there's also the other side where I see online, I see a lot of very visionary artists that are incredibly diverse in how they're using these models. So there's a little bit of a tension going on here between the fact that a lot of these things are very easily replicatable, but it's much more difficult to try and push the boundaries of what's possible and create something new. Um, and it becomes even more complicated because if you think about an art piece, there are so many different factors involved. So you might have some research group A that actually trained the large model that you're using. There might be a second research group that trained another piece of that model. Then there might be person number one who came up with the idea of combining A and B. And then you might have a second person that took the code of that first person but spent months improving it and you know, making it into something that generates beautiful things. And then you have a third person that just takes the code of number two, just runs it on the computer and says, hey, I made a piece of art. And then of course the question is, well, who is the artist? And it's very difficult to give an answer to this question because there are so many different pieces involved into generating the final piece. But then, you know, there have been cases, this has happened, where some of these artworks are sold for a lot of money. And then you can, you can imagine that the struggle begins to try and figure out, well, who, who has ownership? Like, where does this money go to? And so that's where I get to the last part of my talk. I think there are a lot of interesting new opportunities for taking this kind of framework, this new paradigm of creating um, art in a more collective way. Um, I think we've all seen or heard about these guys. I'm not going to spend too many words on the whole NFT and crypto world. Um, do I think it's amazing that many more digital artists can now earn a living by pursuing their passion? Absolutely. I think that's amazing. Um, are NFTs overhyped and are they overshadowing what art should really be about? Probably. Right? So there is, there is a little bit of um, a mismatch there. But I do feel like these blockchain technologies, they have tremendous potential to decentralize the creative process. Because nowadays when we think about art, we always think as it being an individual creation. I create my art and I show it to people. Um, but so lately I've gotten involved in a new project called uh, Abraham. So Abraham is the brainchild of a guy called Gene Kogan. Um, I met Gene uh, two years ago in California. Uh, we spent a lot of time there in the desert. Uh, we've gotten really good friends ever since. And so Gene came up with this idea, Abraham, to create an autonomous digital artist. So the idea is that, you know, this, this, new, this idea is not new. There have been many proposed art DAOs, like a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, and there have been many of these uh, proposals. But in most of them, what happens is that an artist um, contributes some piece of software, a code, a generator, to an art DAO, and then the art DAO generates art, but what essentially happens is that the artist is speaking through the DAO, but it's still the artist that's speaking. But what if the DAO could learn the program instead? Because this would give the DAO its own artistic voice. And so if you look at what's going on in this machine learning and creative AI space, it's that you have a lot of different people that can contribute to an art piece. You could have people contributing music or image data sets, compute resources, people producing code, uh, people coming up with new creative ideas of combining different elements. And we need a lot of people to curate art as well, to look at pieces and say, well, well what does this mean to me? Uh, does this have any value? And so the idea here is to create a generative program whose behavior emerges from the collective intelligence of the network that creates it. You can have a lot of people that are all contributing their own flavor of what they're interested in, but then the artwork itself is generated by an autonomous entity that combines all these different elements. And then of course, if that art is sold and it generates value, well then that value can just flow back through the network. And if everyone is connected to this DAO by a smart contract, it becomes incredibly transparent to see who owns what and who has credit to what. So this is what I mean by blockchains having 
potential, I think, to decentralize the creative process. Um, I'm going to try to go to the demo, but I feel like if I lose the screen, yeah, I lose the screen. Um, damn. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, so uh, I'll, I'll just explain them. Maybe I can somehow, maybe I can put them on Instagram later or something so that you can see. So the idea was what, what I basically did with the images that you guys uploaded and the painters that you named is I used the images as the seed image for my pipeline and then I transformed them using the text sentences, a painting by, and then all the names that you mentioned. So on my computer at home, I have all these beautiful images, but I can't show them to you. So I will, I will make sure to put them on Instagram so that everyone can, can take a look. But so the idea of this is that these new tools, they give us new opportunities. They're not going to replace art as we know it, but they might augment it. From this individual point of view, where you have an artist creating for a crowd, to a more collective, collaborative process. Where instead of you saying, look at my art, what if we could say, look at our art? And I don't know, I, I just think that's a very beautiful idea. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't know, do we have time for questions? Five minutes? Are there questions? <laughs> no questions? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, it's not on there. Hold on. <laughs> I totally forgot. The one at the bottom. <laughs> ah, no, wait a minute. No, 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 no. It's not that one. Oh, I, cha I changed the handle. Okay, finally. <laughs> there. Okay, and any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.